Welcome. My name is Peter Van Praag, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Halifax International Security Forum and all of our staff and volunteers who made this weekend possible, welcome to Halifax. This is our third time together, and at the end of the weekend, I think you'll agree, it is our best forum yet. We have more than 300 participants from more than 40 countries and nearly 30 topics on the agenda. As leaders from the military, civilian government, business, academia, think tanks, NGOs, and the media, you bring a rich variety of perspectives on the issues. Halifax provides an environment for us to learn from each other, share opinions, generate new ideas, and put them into action. Now, more than ever, democratic nations and people with democratic values must work together in new ways to promote international security. Greater cooperation and innovative ideas are needed not only to make better use of tighter military budgets, but also to create economic opportunity, to strengthen democracy, and to promote lasting peace that benefits people everywhere. That's what we mean by international security. That is the mission of Halifax. We are very grateful for the support of our primary partners, the Canadian Department of National Defense and the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency. For a second year, NATO is also serving as a significant sponsor. And this year, for the first time, we're proud to have Foreign Affairs as our media partner. And of course, I'd like to thank the great people of Halifax for hosting us so warmly this weekend. Finally, more than any other single individual, the person most responsible for bringing us all here for the weekend is Canada's Minister of National Defence. It is my privilege to introduce the Member of Parliament from Central Nova and Canada's Minister of National Defence, the Honourable Peter McKay. Well, thank you very much, Peter, for, uh, for those kind remarks. And uh, as I say here in Atlantic Canada, it's a large day. Ministers, Secretary of Defence Panetta, uh, our ambassadors, members of the U.S. Congress, members of the Armed Forces, our veterans, distinguished guests, family and friends. Welcome to the third annual Halifax International Security Forum. It's an honor for me to welcome you to this vibrant city of Halifax in the beautiful province of Nova Scotia. It's a glorious autumn day with a big blue sky outside, and this is a city that is the very heart of Canada's Atlantic Gateway. It's a province that we refer to as Canada's ocean playground. And, at least in the summer months, it's a warm and inviting place. But that's true every day in Halifax, I can assure you. You're part of an interesting and uh, powerful time in our nation's history, in world history. And you're in a part of Canada that has always been a point of convergence for different peoples and cultures. Nearly one million immigrants began their voyage to North America here at Pier 21, now Canada's National Immigration Museum. This is a city home to Canada's East Coast Navy, the Royal Canadian Navy, and the, the largest military base in Canada. Halifax also has the enviable reputation as a hub of knowledge, being home to Canada's finest universities where the leaders of tomorrow debate cutting edge issues and ideas and I know we have some students with us today. Taken together, all of these elements make Halifax the perfect venue to hold an international security forum, a unique event where key leaders and policymakers and thinkers and practitioners come together to share their insights on the global security and defense challenges of the 21st century. Those of you who attended previous forums already know that this is an exceptional, one-of-a-kind event, and I see a lot of familiar and friendly faces here with us today. I welcome you all back. And for new participants, you're in for a tremendous experience. Peter Van Praag and his team have put together a unique gathering 
in a unique gathering place. And they deserve a lot of praise. And Peter, I want to thank you personally. You and your team and our team at National Defense and Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency have done an amazing job in shaping and organizing this 2011 forum. I also want to welcome Foreign Affairs Magazine to the Halifax Forum as the official media sponsor. We're honored to partner with Foreign Affairs, whose outstanding leading edge analysis, global reach, and influential leadership and readership have done so much to shape policy thinking and policy making. Ladies and gentlemen, our conference comes in a dynamic year of dramatic and democratic change. When we convened here last year, some may have signaled that the Middle East and North Africa were ready for popular uprising. Yet who among us would have ever predicted that the desperate actions of a young Tunisian, Mohamed Bouhazi, who committed suicide to protest against the Kafkaesque decision of an autocratic bureaucracy would become the catalyst of protest across the entire region, ultimately bringing down regimes that were powerful and in power for decades, and triggering others to propose political reforms that would have been unthinkable just a few months ago. Last month in Tunisia, citizens voted in free elections for the first time in their country's history. Similarly, in Egypt, we expect democratic elections to begin within the month after the collapse of the Mubarak regime. And with the support of the United Nations, the Arab League, and NATO, this wave of change also reached Libya. In October, after months of fighting, the National Transitional Council has finally been able to declare that country free. We also need to take time to consider the important lessons offered to us by these recent events. They show us that ordinary people, once mobilized, will brave violent repression, even at the risk of their own lives, to defend their ideas, their aspirations, and their human dignity. But perhaps even more importantly, these events also highlight what I believe is one of the key features of the 21st century international system, its fluidity. During past uprisings, whether it be the Prague Spring, the Hungarian uprising, Tiananmen Square, it took weeks for one-way communication to spread by word of mouth, pamphlets, or shortwave radio across the masses. By comparison, this year in Egypt, it took 18 days for protesters organized by Twitter and by Facebook to completely overthrow a regime that had been entrenched for over 30 years. The world and technology are certainly changing. And in this newer, more globalized world, significant events in one country or region can rapidly have consequences cascading around the entire world. Interestingly, some analysts are now telling us that our governments are not well adapted to reach out or react to these new convergences and to the unpredictably of under unpredictability of the international system. These same analysts are predicting that there will be a decline of liberal democracies as a social and political model and of their influence in the world. This analysis is certainly provocative, even trendy, but in my view, it's premature and probably misguided. As the Arab uprisings indicate, democratic ideals still resonate strongly and they stir passion around the world. When hundreds of thousands of Egyptians occupied Tahir Square earlier this year, and when Tunisians and Libyans revolted against their autocratic regimes, they were demanding accountability, transparency, fairness, the rule of law, and economic opportunity. In short, they were demanding representative government. Now, some of the same analysts who predicted the decline of liberal de democratic values are pointing a critical finger at the Middle East. They suggest that Egypt, Libya, and Tunisia will not be able to overcome their difficult history and the transition to more modern and democratic governance. But those who are expecting failure based on regional, historical, or cultural dynamics should remember that democracy is not a spontaneous creation. Just think about the history of our societies and the historical processes still underway that started with an ideal and in the past centuries has evolved through milestones such as the abolition of slavery, two world wars, 
decolonization, and the fight for universal suffrage. It is easy for skeptics to say that other nations will not be able to overcome the obstacles that they face in building their democratic countries. This underestimates the innate determination of all people everywhere to be the masters of their own destinies, to be citizens, not subjects. In my view, this is underestimating the determination of the human spirit. And it is also underestimating the capacity of our democracies to adapt to new circumstances, to modernize, to be a force for good in the world. So how can we better position ourselves to respond to the transformation of our globalized world? In my view, the answer to this question lies in the way that we do business, the business of international engagement. Over the past decade, we've learned important lessons in Afghanistan. We've learned that if we are going to be effective partners for countries in their transition from chaos to conflict to stability and prosperity, we must develop coherence in our actions and in our efforts. We have to break the barriers that exist between our various departments and agencies and ensure that our military, diplomatic, intelligence, police, and development efforts are fully coordinated and geared towards the objectives that we want to achieve. In Canada, we refer to this as the whole of government approach. NATO has a different phrase in, in terms of comprehensive approach. Whatever we call it, we need to ensure that we are continuing to develop coherent strategies to successfully deal with these complex issues. We need this coherence of effort in post-conflict situations like Afghanistan. But also, we need to manage the new dynamics, such as the opportunities and the risks that are emerging from Arab uprisings. And coordinating our efforts to maximize our effectiveness becomes even more important given the fiscal situation that we face. In the current context, we don't have the luxury of throwing more money at our defense and security institutions so that they can adapt to the new circumstances. Quite the contrary. In fact, in most of our countries, we are now working with relatively fewer resources available to tackle these complex challenges. And that's why it's so critical that we define how we can do defense and security differently. That's why we must find ways to be more productive, more agile, and more nimble. Most of us struggle to decide the how. And that is the raison d'etre to this forum, to bring people together in an informative, intelligent, and calm way to discuss these important and sensitive issues and to learn from each other. We should capitalize on this wonderful opportunity provided by this forum and the great program that's been put together for us by the organizers to ask tough questions that will help us find solutions to common challenges. And let me propose a few. Our, our first plenary this afternoon will be about 9-11 and its consequences. Most of our countries in the last decade have been hard at work in dealing with the consequences in the aftermath of this seminal event. But as of our governments, all of our governments, developed strategies to protect our citizens from the threat posed by Al-Qaeda and the radical forms of terrorism, and as many of us got engaged in the very difficult and heavy lifting that was the rebuilding of Afghanistan, 10 years after September 11th, we have to contemplate did we put enough effort in preparing ourselves against the new dangers, such as those posed by cyber warfare? Did we pay enough attention to other threats, such as those posed by weapons of mass destruction in Iran? If China is truly bound to become a superpower, how might we adapt to this new reality? How can we ensure that our democratic ideals and values can still thrive in a world where another successful, far more autocratic system is emerging. These are just a few of the issues and questions that we'll have an opportunity to discuss and wrestle with in the next two days. And as you can see, as you know, this is a very interesting and challenging program with some extraordinary people, including the man I have the pleasure to introduce, the United States Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta. And this morning, the Secretary and I had a chance and uh, we shared some of our views on the challenges facing North America and our continental, collective continental defense, and what we can do to confront these new challenges. We discussed global security issues, critical enablers, 
infrastructure and procurement and a number of uh, other critical issues, and we did it all in 45 minutes. I can't say we solved it all, but we certainly had a, a very uh, free-flowing discussion. And I know, as you do, the incredible career that Secretary Panetta has had and the breadth of his knowledge, of his experience, and all that he brings to his role as Secretary of Defense. I'm very pleased that he's able to join us here in Halifax and share his thoughts on the pertinent issues of which we are all seized. I can't think of anyone more suited to open this year's Halifax International Security Forum in 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Secretary Leon Panetta. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Peter McKay, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to participate in this forum. My fellow defense ministers who are here, uh, members of Congress, members of the Parliament, uh, distinguished members of the military that are here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I truly appreciate uh, this invitation because it gives me a chance to be able to share with you some of the challenges that obviously we all face. Uh, this Halifax International Security Forum is indeed a preeminent forum to be able to uh, present these remarks and to be able to engage in, in the challenges that Peter outlined. This is uh, my first visit to Canada as Secretary of Defense, but it is by no means uh, the first visit to Canada for me. I've uh, had the opportunity to visit here in a number of past capacities, uh, and I've always enjoyed the opportunity to, uh, to come to Canada. Uh, this is a, a great partner, a great neighbor, a great friend, and it's always good to be here. As Peter knows, and as many of you know, uh, I'm very proud of my Italian heritage and uh, as the son of immigrants to come to a place that was the center of immigration uh, is uh, indeed uh, moving for me to be able to be here. And what you may not realize is that uh, John Cabot, the explorer who some credit with being the first European after the Vikings to set foot on the North American mainland was also Italian. His given name was Giovanni Capotto. And he landed somewhere around where we are today, uh, around 1497. So Peter and the rest of our hopes, our, our hosts here today, I hope you won't mind if I join all of you in welcoming you to Halifax. <laughs> or as Giovanni Capotto would have said, benvenuto. <laughs> I come here with a great deal of respect for the historic relationship between our two great nations. It was a little over 50 years ago that someone who inspired me to get into public service John F. Kennedy, traveled to Ottawa on his first trip outside the United States as president. And I still remember very vividly his famous description of the bonds, the bonds between the United States and Canada delivered in a speech before Parliament. He said, and I quote, Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends. Economics has made us partners. And necessity has made us allies. Those whom nature hath so joined together, let no man put asunder, unquote. The respect I have for this relationship has only grown as I've gotten to work with Canadian leaders throughout my time as a member of Congress, as White House Chief of Staff under President Clinton, 
as director of the CIA and now in my current position as defense secretary. We are in a very real way part of one family. One family that is mutually dependent on one another on this North American continent. That mutual dependence extends to issues of security, the subject of this conference, and also the focus of the same speech that President Kennedy gave before the Canadian Parliament. Delivered at the height of the Cold War tensions confronting the world, Kennedy reminded his Canadian audience that, quote, no free nation can stand alone. No free nation can stand alone to meet the threat of those who make themselves our adversaries, unquote. Although the world has changed in so many ways, this message resonates as strongly today as it did in 1961. So too does the basic framework President Kennedy offered that day for meeting our security challenges and the security challenges of that era. That common challenges demand common action. Today, 50 years ago, like 50 years ago, common action necessitates strong leadership among all of us to forge strong alliances in this hemisphere, across the Atlantic, and indeed around the globe. With that in mind, I would like to discuss today the priority the United States is placing on strengthening our alliances and partnerships for the 21st century as we near a turning point after a decade of war and adapt to a new set of challenges and priorities. As we in the United States confront the fiscal realities of limited resources, we believe that we have the opportunity to establish a force for the future that while smaller, is agile, flexible, deployable, and technologically equipped to confront the threats of the future. It must be complemented by the full range of America's national security capabilities, strong intelligence, strong diplomacy, a strong economy, strong technology, developments in cyber capabilities, using that great experience that we've gained from 10 years of war to be innovative, to be creative about the kind of force that we need for the future. But it must also be complemented by strong alliances partnerships, regional efforts at cooperation, all have to be part of the answer. The U.S. alliance system remains the bedrock of our approach to security across the globe, and an enduring strategic advantage and force multiplier that no rival possesses. The reality is that the United States military alone cannot be all things to all nations. We will maintain our excellence. We will maintain our excellence. We will maintain our leadership. But in the effort to maintain our excellence and our leadership, we also have to meet our security commitments around the world. 
And in doing that, we must and we will sharpen the application of our resources. Better, better deploy our forces in the world and share our burdens more and more effectively with our partners. And frankly, all of our allies need to do the same. It will be even more essential as we confront new and more complex security challenges in the years ahead to be able to build strong alliances and strong partnerships from terrorism to nuclear proliferation, from cyber attacks to the threats we face often. All of these challenges do not recognize national boundaries and can't be addressed effectively by any one nation alone. Such trans transnational threats demand a shared response. That's why I've made it a priority to build and maintain partnerships across the globe. It's a theme I reiterated extensively during the international travel that I made last month in Europe, in Asia, and in the Middle East. It has thus loomed large in our strategic review of the Department of Defense. This review is an effort not only to grapple with new budgetary realities, but also to adapt the force to better confront current and future security challenges. As we look at our global alliances, certainly none has been more successful than NATO, which I consider a real tribute to the decades of investment and capabilities and joint training and the determination of leaders from the transatlantic community, many of whom I'm glad are here today. Revitalizing NATO has been a centerpiece of the Obama administration's efforts to build stronger alliances and stronger partnerships. As this alliance has expanded from a foundational focus on collective territorial defense to include expeditionary out-of-area operations. We have seen the payoff. We've seen the payoff in Afghanistan, where 49 countries, 49 countries, have come together, largely under a NATO umbrella, expending both blood and treasure to prevent al-Qaeda from ever again being able to use Afghanistan as a safe haven. To all our ISAF partners, we are profoundly grateful for your sacrifice and for your steadfast partnership. Here in Halifax, I want to pay particular tribute to Canada's decade-long effort in Afghanistan, where your distinguished military has performed in one of the most dangerous parts of the country, performed in an outstanding manner, the Taliban heartland of Kandahar. We all owe a deep debt of gratitude to the more than 150 fallen Canadian heroes from the Afghanistan campaign, brave men and women who have paid the ultimate price and whose names are etched on black granite at Kandahar Airfield. Alongside the United States, Canada's contribution to NATO's Libya operations also proved critical to our success. During my visit to Europe last month, I had the opportunity to visit Allied Joint Forces Command headquarters in Naples, where I received a thorough briefing on the operation from Canadian Air Force General Charlie Bouchard, who very ably orchestrated NATO's daily efforts. He was tough, he was able, he took no prisoners. 
It's not too strong to say that his leadership, steady and sure, proved vital to our eventual success in that mission. And I want to thank him personally and here publicly for his courage and for his stewardship. As we look to forge a stronger NATO that draws on our experiences in Afghanistan and Libya, the United States will continue to play a decisive role in safeguarding the shared interests of our NATO partners. Part of doing so is enabling allies and partners to contribute their share to the common defense. To do that, however, the Alliance needs to develop new capabilities to keep pace with emerging threats, even in an era of fiscal austerity. As I said in Brussels last month, these challenging economic times cannot be an excuse for walking away from our security responsibilities. I refuse to believe that we have to choose between fiscal responsibility and national security. Instead, we must commit to ensuring that NATO addresses key shortfalls in areas such as intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, precision strike munitions, and aerial refueling and lift capabilities. To fill these gaps, allied nations will need to pool their declining defense dollars to more efficiently and effectively, as General Rasmussen has outlined in his Smart Defense Initiative. We are looking to make more progress on this front when our leaders gather next year in Chicago. Modernizing NATO also means ensuring that investments are focused on the most likely future threats, in particular the challenge posed by countries like Iran, who are developing intermediate range missiles capable of targeting Europe. The United States has been leading the way on NATO's efforts to establish missile defense. Most recently, when we announced that the United States would deploy EJA ships to the Mediterranean. We are also hoping that missile defense will provide NATO and Russia an avenue for its most meaningful cooperation yet, presenting an opportunity for former adversaries to firmly turn a page on the past and deal meaningfully and effectively with the real threats that emanate out of the Middle East. Our progress on missile defense is a tangible sign of how far we've come in modernizing the NATO alliance. It's also a sign of our determination to sustain a capable and effective NATO and to live up to our collective security commitments on the continent of Europe, including our responsibilities under Article 5. But we must also constantly assess the forms of engagement that are most appropriate in light of the capabilities of our allies and the threats that we face. These are the discussions that we're having at the department as part of our strategy and global posture review. Discussions that are forcing us to be very disciplined in setting priorities so that we maintain our global leadership role while meeting our fiscal responsibilities to the American taxpayer. Let me be clear at the outset that the United States will always ensure that we maintain the right mix of forces and capabilities, including those stationed in Europe, prepared to meet the full range of security challenges acting in concert with our allies, including instability on its periphery and unforeseen developments. At the same time, we must build on our success with the transatlantic alliance 
and further enhance our collective security by building enduring and capable 21st century security architecture in other critical regions of the globe, beginning right here in this part of the world. Working with Canada, we are encouraging new partnerships in the Pacific, but also in the Western Hemisphere, recognizing that regional challenges right here in our own hemisphere, from transnational criminal organizations to natural disasters, require stronger regional institutions that can deliver regional solutions. We remain committed to strong bilateral partnerships with Canada and Mexico. And we are also working with Canada to find more opportunities for our three countries to partner together in this hemisphere. Another important mechanism is the Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas, which has turned into a valuable forum for discussion and collaboration on key defense and security issues. And as we look across the globe, two regions stand out as being home to particularly vexing challenges. It is apparent to all that the Asia-Pacific region is going to be a principal force behind world economic growth with lines of commerce and trade that are constantly expanding and security challenges that are growing in complexity. In the Middle East, another region crucial to the global economy and U.S. interests. We've seen dramatic changes as a result of the Arab Spring. We've seen continuing violence. We see continuing extremism. We see continuing instability. And the threat from Iran continues to pose challenges. So as the United States draws down its forces in Iraq and begins to draw down its surge forces in Afghanistan, we also have to maintain a strong presence in the Middle East and work closely with our allies and our partners to bolster multilateral cooperation in countering threats emanating from Al-Qaeda, from Iran, and elsewhere. Given the global nature of security challenges and the global interests that are at stake, we need to build multilateral structures that will enable all of our allies and all of our partners to better cooperate to counter common threats. That includes encouraging Canada and our European allies to join us in meeting common challenges whether it's in Asia Pacific or in the Middle East or throughout the Western Hemisphere, and enabling them to do so through NATO when appropriate. As we examine our geographic priorities, it's important to remember that we can and we will do more than one thing at a time. U.S. security commitments are not zero sum. And even as we enhance our presence in the Pacific, we will not surrender our status as a global power and a global leader. As a country with global interests and responsibilities, and with a military with unique global strength and reach, America will remain committed to global security. In particular, we will continue to defend our shared interests in free and open commerce, the rule of law, freedom of movement across the global commons of air and sea and space and cyberspace, which is ultimately the bedrock of our security and our prosperity and that of our allies. American and Canadian leadership have built a system of global security alliances and partnerships that have safeguarded and advanced the cause of liberty and prosperity and security for decades. As we move forward, as we make the tough decisions needed 
to ensure a better life for our children and our grandchildren. We will not back away from these alliances and these partnerships. Indeed, they are a key to our ability to provide that strong defense for the future. We will strengthen them, and in so doing, we will strengthen our two great nations so that we know even greater prosperity and even greater security in the century that lies ahead. In the words of John Kennedy, no free nation can stand alone to meet the threat of those who would make themselves our adversaries. We stand together as friends, as neighbors, as partners, as allies. That bond is the essential key to security in the 21st century. Thank you.